We begin tonight with breaking news. The Supreme Court allowing evictions to resume across the United States. Today's ruling now blocking the Biden administration's ban because of the pandemic. According to Census Bureau data from early August, about three and a half million people said they faced eviction in the next two months. The Supreme Court saying the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention lacked the authority to reimpose the moratorium and needed authorization from Congress. The Texas Supreme Court ruling mask mandates in Bear County cannot continue, but the city and county plan to fight that decision in the fourth court of appeals. Meanwhile, the Bear County District Attorney says he will not prosecute schools who choose to mandate masks because the Texas Education Agency has said they would allow mask mandates as well. Let's take a look now at the latest COVID cases in Bear County. 45 COVID related deaths reported in just the past two days. Mayor Ron Nirenberg saying today each one was preventable with the COVID-19 vaccine. Over at our hospitals, 1,365 COVID patients are hospitalized. Of those, 29 patients are children. With children under 12 ineligible to get the vaccine, health officials continue to encourage wearing a mask. Mask mandates in schools is a topic that, as we've seen over the last few weeks, often gets heated. And recently, we've seen just how tense things can get during school board meetings. Parents and others sharing why they want to see masks in schools or why they don't. But are those claims accurate or just more misinformation? The night team's John Paul Barajas took those claims to local medical professionals. Those masks, if you read all the studies, are about 50% effective. So 9% effective. And that's only if you wear it correctly. These parents did not cite any particular studies. The CDC analyzed data in several states that support masks reduce the spread of COVID. Infectious disease Dr. Ruth Bergeron tells us it depends on if you wear your mask correctly and consistently throughout the day and provided this analogy. You're going to wear a seatbelt and you're going to mind the speed limit. And you know full well that doing both of those things doesn't hand you a guarantee that you won't get in an accident. They improve your odds and they improve your safety. Other parents added they were OK with themselves and their kids getting sick, arguing they are building immunity. COVID is real. COVID is here to stay. But now we must learn, learn to adapt and carry on. Doctors explained you do get natural immunity if you survive COVID. But with new variants, it's not a risk you should take. What we've learned over the last few months is that people that have had prior infection with COVID-19 and have developed natural immunity, antibodies from natural infection, unfortunately are not protected against this new Delta variant. People who had been uh, just recovered from COVID relying on that natural immunity were twice as likely to get COVID again than fully vaccinated people. The low percentage of child deaths was also a point of argument. Yes, it's rare that children die from COVID, but the highly infectious Delta variant can cause them to get seriously sick, and the long-term effects on their health are unknown. Now, while overall, less kid, kids have less severe disease than adults, if you have enough kids get sick, you're still going to have a percentage of them end up in the hospital, and unfortunately, some are dying. And another point parents made that was that if kids wear masks for a long period of time, it could cause them physical harm. Dr. Bergeron says there is no science that indicates physical harm can be caused by wearing masks. John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. All right, thanks, John Paul. Meantime, classrooms are stuck in a tug of war. Rural school districts flustered with the political war over masks, all while they try to focus on educating students and keeping them safe. School districts in Medina and Uvalde counties where COVID-19 hospitalization rates are up are seeing those infection numbers in their student population. The NAT team's Patty Santos tells us how superintendents are trying to educate parents. Veronica Cuellar, like many parents, worried about the quickly spreading Delta variant in rural communities and schools like hers. If our children get sick, where are we going to turn to? You know, and San Antonio's full. That's a concern echoed by many school administrators, too, who wish they could do more. I can just plead all parents to understand that the schools are doing the very best they can under the situations that we're put under. We, we are a political pawn in this, this conversation. Sabina ISD superintendent we... says there's been 20 COVID cases reported in the district this school year so far. There were only 13 all of last school year. I think it's pretty simple. Uh, wearing masks and 
quickly quarantining uh, people Put a stop to the spread. Without the ability to mandate masks, superintendents like Richard Grill are educating parents on protocols and setting up multiple vaccination clinics. He estimates that about 50% of students and 65% of staff are using masks. Here's a look at the COVID cases in the districts in Uvalde and Medina County since school started. Uvalde and Kinipa districts have the highest numbers at 44 and 37 respectively. I told the superintendents to expect more cases in their classes simply because we cannot we don't have the same tools available that we had last year. Uvalde Health Authority Dr. Jared Reading pleads with families to get vaccinated and take precautions to slow the spread in schools. Right now with COVID, if your kid is showing any signs at all, don't send them to school. And frank frankly, um, until you know that it's not COVID, you shouldn't even send their siblings to school. And superintendents I spoke with say they're trying to avoid the whole mask mandate situation that's playing out in lawsuits because it only creates confusion and frustration. Instead, they are asking parents to look at what the situation was last school year when kids were wearing masks and they had low infection rates. Myra, Steve. Thank you, Patty. Amid this pandemic, feed stores have been thrust into the spotlight now. Many stores are seeing one product fly off store shelves, but that product can carry dangerous consequences. Ivermectin a, is used to treat parasites in animals like horses and cattle. But misinformation about the product and COVID-19 is prompting some people to take it. Over at Lock Hill Pet Feed and Lawn Supply, customers are being warned. The uh, ivermectin that we saw here at the feed store is not recommended for human use, for human consumption. Everything we have here is for animal use, for cattle, for horses, anything like that. People are coming in and, and again, we cannot recommend it for human use. People are using it, though. The FDA said it's had multiple reports of patients who have been hospitalized, self-medicating with the drug that's intended for livestock. The FDA talking on Twitter saying, you are not a horse, you are not a cow. The COVID-19 vaccine is meant to offer protection from the coronavirus. You can receive free vaccines right now at your local pharmacy or at pop-up clinics in San Antonio. We have a full list of locations on our website, ksat.com. A fiery crash claiming the lives of at least three people tonight. Investigators in Seguin left to go through the wreckage along I-10 at the State Highway 123 bypass. Police say a big rig lost its load, which made the road slick. Another semi-truck tried to swerve out of the way, but then hit another vehicle in the process, then crashed into a guardrail before catching fire. Several other vehicles also crashing as a result, leading to at least three deaths. The crash happening earlier this afternoon, but the eastbound lanes of I-10 in this area expected to remain closed until midnight. A child's remains found and a San Antonio woman now detained in Colorado, according to multiple sources. Because that woman has not been formally charged, we are not naming her yet. SAPD, the FBI, and U.S. Marshals all investigating this case. The FBI assisted SAPD by detaining the woman in a foreign country and then bringing her to Colorado. Sources say the child's body was found last night in a national forest west of Denver. More to follow on this story. A chaos and confusion rising after a deadly attack in Kabul. At least 13 U.S. service members killed, 15 others injured. There are also 60 Afghan allies who were killed following two blasts, one at a gate nearby the airport where many tried to evacuate, another at a nearby hotel. Those explosions happening hours after the U.S. Embassy in Kabul warned Americans to leave the airport immediately after intelligence of an attack was presented. President Joe Biden issuing a warning to the terror group ISIS-K, which is claiming responsibility. To those who carried out this attack, as well as anyone who wishes America harm, know this, we will not forgive. We will not forget. We will hunt you down and make you pay. The Kabul Emergency Hospital says it is treating dozens of patients injured in the attack. It's unclear how this withdrawal will continue as the U.S. moves closer to Tuesday's deadline. One woman who calls San Antonio home trained dozens of Afghan allies for the U.S. military, 65 of them reaching out to her for help. 
those groups leaving the area before today's blast, but they still remain stuck in Kabul. Lark Escobar is the woman's name. She says the Taliban has threatened the families she's trying to help. She says the time needed to gain the proper documents for these allies is not available in such a tight deadline and now under an emergency situation. So we can see that everyone is suffering because the United States has not adequately prepared for emergency situations. And right now it's jeopardizing everyone, including people we care about. She says she is leaving no stone unturned in her attempt to help these allies that remain stuck overseas in Afghanistan. She's even reached out to President Joe Biden on social media. The multiple cameras capturing chaos in one neighborhood, the car crash that led to a massive house fire. We hear from a witness coming up. And the COVID-19 vaccine is free, but choosing not to get the shot is already costing one company some big bucks. How one airline is planning to cover those costs coming up. And the deadly blast in Afghanistan killing U.S. troops and Afghan allies. We just talked about it. Up next, we're going to take a closer look at the group behind the attacks. Who is ISIS-K and how were they formed? Next on the Night Beat. The two attacks amid the withdrawal of Americans and Afghan allies. An ISIS affiliate claiming responsibility for those blasts that left 13 U.S. troops dead, as well as 60 Afghan allies. President Biden vowing the U.S. will make the extremists pay. Tonight, we're taking a closer look at the group that calls themselves ISIS-K. The K stands for Khorasan. That's an area around the Afghanistan-Pakistan border. The group splintered off from the ISIS group in Syria and Iraq, forming a strong presence in eastern Afghanistan about six years ago. The group is mostly made up of former Taliban fighters who left the t after the Taliban pursued peace talks with the U.S. ISIS-K is described as having even more extremist views and is a sworn enemy of the Taliban. The ISIS offshoot estimated to have 1,500 to 2,200 fighters. And our coverage of what's happening in Afghanistan continues online at KSAT.com. The U.S. is still trying to complete the withdrawal by Tuesday's deadline. At last check, the U.S. trying to get in touch with as many as 1,000 Americans about evacuations. Let's switch gears now in a home no longer livable after a car slams into the building before flames begin to spread. There you see it. Just, they're just slamming into the garage. A neighbor's surveillance camera rolling as this blue car slams in and out of that garage before reversing and slamming into it again. This all taking place in Ontario, Canada. Contractors working on a home nearby also witnessed the scene. One witness attempted to get the woman out of the car. I had her out down but to the sidewalk. She was screaming, pulling away, and then she got away from me and she ran somewhere down the house side of the house and I didn't see her again. That's when the fire. Yeah, moments later, smoke started billowing from the garage. One person inside able to make it out of the home and within minutes, the fire spread, leaving behind extensive damage. Officers took the woman into custody and she faces several charges, including arson. Former President Donald Trump named in a lawsuit over the Capitol chaos back in January. Seven Capitol Police officers who were attacked and beaten that day filed this lawsuit. They accused the former president, his allies and members of extremist groups of working together in, quote, an unlawful effort to stay in power, end quote. Meanwhile, hundreds of people are facing criminal charges linked to that insurrection. At least three of them are from the San Antonio area. Another reason to get the COVID-19 vaccine, your pocketbook. The unvaccinated could expect to pay more for health coverage. Delta Airlines already adding charges for its unvaccinated employees, saying they will see an additional $200 charge each month. The surcharge will begin in November. Delta defending its decision, saying the change in policy necessary since the average hospital stay for the virus costs the airline $50,000. The airline CEO saying all employees hospitalized for the virus in recent weeks were not fully vaccinated. This change could fuel more companies to do the same. Take a look outside tonight. Sky 12 flying high above the city. We're headed towards Friday and the weekend. That's not just the only good news. We got some rain <laughs> to talk about as well. At least yeah. some chances. 
And we yeah. exactly and some folks along 1604 on the north side of town and even the northwest side of town got around a quarter of an inch of rain earlier today. We had a few isolated downpours pop up, so some pop up showers. They're back. They'll stay in the forecast every afternoon through about Sunday. Tropical Storm Ida. I've got the full update on that. We just got the latest information from the Hurricane Center, so we'll go into that in depth and the updated track forecast. And the key with the track forecast now is we have a lot more confidence in that forecast. So let's get right to it. First of all, taking a look at the rainfall we had today, you see a narrow swath in Northern Bear County. As I mentioned, a few folks got up to about a quarter of an inch. And for the most part, not everybody saw a rainfall, but there was some particularly in the hill country. That was the sweet spot today. Areas of uh, spotty rain in the hill country. A few lingering showers just south of Kerrville, west of Comfort right now, but that's all we have hanging on out there. Here's a look at our future cast starting tomorrow morning. By the time we get into the midday noon to two o'clock, we'll probably have a few pop ups here and there. Not a whole lot. You could count them on one hand. So we progress into the afternoon and early evening. We'll see a few more developing, especially as we get more outflow boundaries from the storms and where those outflow boundaries travel, they can kick up their own little showers. But what I want to focus on here is not the exact placement of these predicted pop up showers. It's just the fact that we're seeing a few of them even developing on the future cast. We've got the conditions for them. Nothing severe, just some isolated areas of heavy rainfall. Uh, very quick splash and dash here and there. Don't get your hopes too high because coverage is going to be very limited only to about 30% of Central and South Texas. That'll be the case the next couple of afternoons. We'll start to see those rain chances fall off, particularly into early next week on Monday as the rain, the tropical moisture is very likely to stay far east of our area and generally speaking east of Texas as we get into the weekend. So this is the latest on Tropical Storm Ida. Still a very weak system and fairly unorganized, but it does have some winds strong enough to be a tropical storm. Max is stayed at 40 miles per hour. This is likely to move into the Gulf of Mexico Saturday. At that point, rapidly intensify throughout the day on Saturday and even into Sunday, then likely making landfall during the day on Sunday, particularly closer to about sunset or a little bit uh, before somewhere along the Louisiana to Mississippi uh, shoreline. Again, that's later on Sunday as a cat tube. I think it'll honestly be stronger than a category two, but that's what the Hurricane Center has it at right now. So right now there's a growing confidence that this is going to be kept well east of our area and the primary impacts would be even east of Texas. So that's the latest on Ida. Of course, that track can drift one way or another, so we'll keep you updated on it. 97, the high temperature today, that's two degrees above average. Right now, 84 degrees, feels like 90, some 70s in the hill country. Actually, parts of the hill country was in the 70s earlier today because of the rain cooled air. We'll start the day tomorrow in the 70s, rise into the mid 90s again. A few of those pop up afternoon showers, more of the same temperatures just rising a little bit into next week up to about 98. All right, thank you, Adam. All right, BGC began tonight. He sure did. With it, our new partners. That's true. First of all, we had the big game with Brandeis and O'Connor. That yeah. is a neighborhood rivalry, and that's kind of a surprising score when we come back from that. Also, it is a debut of KSAT BTV, Texas Sports Productions Game of the Week. Got all the highlights for you there as well, and no limitations when it comes to that man, all right? There, coming up. Kick off the 2021 high school football season tonight with a neighborhood rivalry to get big game coverage going. O'Connor versus Brandeis in the first non-district game ever. Check out the stands. They're packed at Ferris Stadium tonight. Sold out last Wednesday to see the new head coach of the Broncos, Charles Bruce, in his first game after leaving Wagner. Brandeis is drawing first blood. They are in the Panthers' red zone. J.C. Evans to Julian Ezeguiri on the hot route. Ezeguiri gets a nice block to clear him at the lane to get him in the end zone for the first score of the game. 7-0 Broncos. Broncos keep it going on the ground. This time Evans drops back, doesn't see anything he likes, so he he tucks it and runs a 23 yard score, puts Brandeis up 14 to nothing. They would go up 21 to nothing in halftime. The final from Ferris 33 to 7. Brandeis. Let's head over to Gustafson Stadium where the Harlan Hawks kicking out their season against Clark Cougars. Remember, this is a non district game after Clark was moved to 28 6 A with all the Northeast schools. There's no score in the first quarter. The Cougars have the ball third and five deep in Hawks territory, looking to keep the drive alive. Quarterback Nick Lee to Michael Vasquez in the flat for the seven yard gain and a fresh set of downs. Later in the drive, Lee Chris to a Lee driving to Chris Gertz on the screen pass and look at Gertz go. Cougars take a seven to nothing lead. The final from Gus. Let's we'll see how they do. 
Clark gets a big win, 28-14. The Battling Billies of Fredericksburg visiting the Sam Houston Hurricanes tonight at Alamo Stadium. We have no score in the first quarter. Billies have the ball inside the Hurricanes 20-yard line. Running back John Fritch goes up the middle, rumbles for the 10-yard gain. Two plays later, it's Fritch again. This time he hits Pater from five yards out to go up 7-0. The final from Alamo Stadium, 56-6 Fredericksburg. Now let's run over to SAISD Sports Complex. Next to Burbank High School, the Bulldogs are up 7-0 over Pearsall. When we arrive, Pearsall with the ball trying to even things up. But the snap is low. The ball is loose. It looks like the Mavericks recover, but Jeremiah Vallejo knocks it out of the running back's hands, and Chris Mendez jumps on it for the Bulldogs. Bulldogs trying to get tricky with the flea flicker going deep, but it's off target. Jorge Harada for the Pearsall is there for the interception. Let's check that final. Burbank hangs on for the win, 17-7. Here it is, our first broadcast of KSAT Me TV. Texas Sports Productions broadcast of the Madison Mavericks and Clemens Buffalo tonight. Clemens returns the opening kick 69 yards from the Madison 7-yard line. Very first play of the season. They cough it up. Miguel Becker causing the fumble for the Mass. Aaron Bowles catches it as it pops loose. Madison capitalizes. They put together a 97-yard drive. Ends a quarterback Caden Mata keeping it on the zone read for the four-yard score. 7-0 Madison. The final from Linov. Madison over Clemens 14-5. We're off to Rutledge Stadium. Veterans Memorial facing off against Del Rio. Alex Alvado wide open. Western Ross for the Patriots score. Let's check that final now as well as he gets into the end zone. 55-20. Veterans Memorial with a big win. For the first time in school history, the Holy Cross Knights are playing under the lights because they were installed this offseason. That's right. Knights and night game against Bernie Geneva. Holy Cross is up 7-2 in the third. Knights with the ball trying to add to that lead, but the deep ball is picked off by Aiden Cristal, returned all the way to inside the Knights' five-yard line, and two plays later, Grayson Donnell to Ethan Valdez with a two-yard score, 8-7 to seven, Bernie Geneva. has said to the big game covered scoreboard for that final and more tonight. Holy Cross and Bernie Geneva now tied in the fourth. This is a late start, 7:45 tied at 15 also. There's time left in that game. Veterans of Memorial over Del Rio, 55-20. to 20. That final is in Southside, where their star quarterback headed to Nebraska, 62 to 14 over Lopez. He had seven touchdowns at one time, I think, in the first half. And Santa Gratuitas Academy, 46 to nothing over South San West Campus. Dak Prescott ready to go full throttle next. Pro football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. Dallas Cowboys star quarterback Dap Prescott is ready to go full throttle with no limitations. That's according to offensive coordinator Kellen Moore. One day after Prescott was back in team drills for the first time since July 28th in Oxnard. Prescott had felt pain in his throwing shoulder that day. An MRI showed that the team it had a strained muscle. Now he appears to be healed and ready for the start of the regular season on September the 9th against the defending Super Bowl champion Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So what has it been like for Ezekiel Elliott to work out in the Texas heat for the first time this week since returning from training camp at a much cooler Cooler California. It's been a little different, you know, getting back in the heat, um, but it's definitely necessary. We got a game to get ready for September 9th, so um, just getting back here, getting acclimated, kind of getting our feet under us in this heat uh, in this humidity. Um, but it feels good. Uh, we had a good practice today. I think we made a, a big step for it. Didn't look like you there for a while, did it? The Cowboys will close out their preseason Sunday when they host the Jacksonville Jaguars at noon. Meantime, the Houston Texans in their preseason against the defending Super Bowl champs, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Texans defensive end Justin Reed was asked what it'll be like to go up against seven-time Super Bowl champion Tom Brady if he does indeed play. This is the best test you can have. I mean, we're going against the defending Super Bowl champs. Brady is the greatest quarterback of all time, so, I mean, this is the people you want to play. I still have yet to pick him off, even though I should have. You know what I mean? Wish I could have some of those back. So this will be a, a fun game to play in against him. Yes, it will. They close out the preseason Saturday night at 7 against Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and then the regular season is just around the corner. <laughs> and they really think Tom Brady's going to play in that game? I would doubt maybe, it. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe a yeah. down or two. Yeah, maybe. Sure. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Greg. We'll be right back. Tomorrow, very similar to today, low to mid 90s for most of us across South and even Central Texas in the hill country near 90. Converse about 91, Bernie 89, Castroville 92. Tropical moisture stays east of us this weekend and into next week, but we'll have a few pop ups here and there through the weekend. All right, thanks, Adam. That's it for the night beat GMSA at 430. Have a good night.